Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Today's presenter is Dr. Jennifer Chan. Dr. Chan is a thoracic surgeon. But today's topic is lung cancer and we'll be, I'll be giving an update in everyday terms because this is really for you. Okay, so it's Lung Cancer Month, or Lung Cancer ha Awareness Month, so happy Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Doesn't get as much publicity as October or Breast Cancer Month or even Movember, which is currently right now for prostate cancer. But we do have a month. It is now, it's for the entire month, and we even have our own white ribbon. And why is that? Just some facts about lung cancer in general. Anyone can get lung cancer. It is associated with smoking, and we'll go into that a little bit in more detail, but majority of the cancers are actually occur in former smokers and never smokers. You do not have to be a current smoker to get lung cancer. In fact, 10 to 15% of all lung cancers are found in never smokers. These tend to be common in women of Asian or Caucasian ancestry, and for whatever reason, we just don't know. But we see a lot of, we do see a, a, a good percentage of lung cancers in never smokers. It is still the second most common cancer in men and women. One in 16 Americans will get a diagnosis of lung cancer. Breast cancer is more common in women. Prostate cancer is more common in men. But lung cancer is still the second most common in both genders. It is the leading cause of cancer death in both men and women worldwide. More people die of lung cancer on an annual basis compared to prostate, breast, and colon cancer combined. Some more facts about lung cancer. All stages for a, a comparison, for at five years survival, looking at data from 2016, prostate cancer had the best outcome. This is stages one through four, so early to very advanced. Breast is still up there close to 90%. Colorectal is about 50% at 64% five-year survival rate. But lung cancer is below 20%. Only 16% of all lung cancer cases are diagnosed at an early stage, meaning curable. Even some more facts. So it counts for 13% of all new cancers in the US, 13 to 14%, but close to 25% of all cancer deaths. The American Cancer Society estimates that lung cancer in the United States for this past year will have over 200,000 new cases of lung cancer and about almost 150,000 deaths just this year alone. And as you can see on the chart to the right, breast cancer gets the most money in terms of research funding, and that's because of the awareness. We, have all the, we celebrate the entire month of October for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We do a, a ton of fundraisers, a ton of walks. Lung cancer? We have lung cancer walks, but not very often. No one knows about them. And we spend a dismal... $2,488 per person on lung cancer. But the good news is that all cancer deaths are on the decline since the early 1990s. You see this rise is here is lung cancer death. It was on a steep incline, and this is related to the smoking history, but after 1991, it started decreasing. That's when we started knowing more about smoking and, and its health-related risks. All cancers in general are going on a decline, but look at how the differential between lung cancer deaths and everything else. It's pretty dramatic. And so what, and why is that? Well, number one is the reduction in smoking. We know more about smoking and the dangers of smoking. We have new treatment advances that literally came out in the last five to 10 years. And we now have early detection for lung cancer. So let's talk about reduction in smoking, cigarette smoking, or as I like to call it, nicotine and the other stuff. So when we talk about cigarette smoking, we're talking about tobacco and nicotine. Nicotine is what addicts people to cigarettes. 
the other stuff, the other chemicals that bind in the cigarettes, it's a constellation of nearly 200 ingredients, seven of which are known toxins and known cancer-causing agents. We know with cigarette smoking, based on research and data and, and all the warnings, we know that it, it increases cancer risk, not only in lung cancer, it increases cancer risk in stomach cancer, breast cancer, bladder cancer, colon cancer. Also increases your risk of stroke, heart attacks, vascular disease, other health conditions such as diabetes and arthritis, and definitely has an effect on pregnancy and fertility issues. It is the leading preventative cause of death in the U.S., meaning this is something that we, can, we, we have control as patients. So the question, to quit or not to quit, that's not even a question. We know that by quitting smoking, one year after quitting smoking, your risk for a heart, heart attack drops dramatically. Within two to five years of quitting smoking, your risk of stroke normalizes to that of a person who's never smoked. Cancers of the mouth, throat, head and neck, esophagus, bladder drop by half within five years, but it takes nearly 10 years for your risk of for your risk for lung cancer to drop by half. Just a quick word about vaping and e-cigarettes. We don't really know enough yet, so that's basically what I'm gonna say. We, there's, there's a lot more research coming, there's a lot more publicity about it right now because of what's going on with the lung, vaping-related lung disease. The intention of vaping was mechanism to get people off cigarettes. Vaping and e-cigarettes, as they were designed, were just nicotine-only substitutes much like the Nicorette gum or the patch, without the toxins. The reality is the, the vaping cartridges are coming with other stuff in addition to the nicotine, other additives that we don't know yet, okay? So right now we don't know enough. It took literally decades for the tobacco industry to acknowledge the health risks of cigarettes, and that involved a lot of political pressure a lot of lawsuits and a lot of research. So, but back to today's topic, our unhappy lungs. So we're gonna primarily talk about lung cancer in its primary form, meaning cancer starts in the lung, can spread somewhere else. I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be talking about cancer that's found in the lung and started somewhere else, say like a breast cancer that went to the lung or colon cancer that went to the lung. I'm talking about a lung cancer that started in the lung primarily. Two main forms, the most common form, there are multiple forms, but the two most common forms are what's called a non-small cell lung cancer and a small cell lung cancer. Most of, the patient, most of our patients in the United States have a non-small cell lung cancer. And there's other, other smaller varieties along the way, but this very busy picture shows your lung. So on the right side, you've got three parts, an upper, a middle, and a lower part. On the left, you have an upper and a lower part. And this is the same conversation I have with all my patients who come to me with lung cancer. Your lungs basically help bring in the good air, bring in the oxygen, filter out the carbon dioxide. They are connected by, to you through airway or trachea, and it branches off to a tree. This is what we call the pulmonary tree. You can see these little, little green dots along the way. These are the lymph nodes, and we'll talk about lymph nodes, okay? We're gonna talk about lung cancer staging, how me as a physician, as a doctor, helps treat lung cancer, helps figure out what the best treatment is, and I work together with other doctors, including a medical oncologist who's a doctor that gives you the cancer drugs, and a radiation oncologist who's a doctor that provides the radiation therapy, and we'll talk, I'll talk briefly about all those treatment options. So how do we stage lung cancer? Well. We talk about our TNM staging. It tells us how advanced that cancer is. And the reason we call it TNM is because we have the tumor, which is T, the lymph nodes, the N, and metastasis, the M. So the tumor, the primary tumor in the lung itself, this is more like real estate. Think of that real estate question. Location, 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 okay? You, want, you don't want the big house next to the freeway. You want the small little shack off to the beach away from the freeway. That's what you want. So going back to this picture, you would rather have a small little, small little tumor out in the outer parts of the lung with this being, the center being the freeway. And why is that? Well, not only is tumor size and location important, lymph nodes, 
these little kidney bean colored shape entities. They're all throughout your body. You have them from head to toe. You can barely see them. You should barely see them, but they're everywhere in your body. They, they perform a very important function of filtering your, your immune system, providing immune response, bringing cholesterol and, 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 and all that good fat stuff into your, in, into your blood vessels. But they live everywhere. And in, in, in the chest, they live primarily along the middle, which, along your trachea. And this is how lung cancer and other cancers spread. So you want them away from your lymph nodes. If they happen to get into your lymph nodes, they have a chance of spreading, which is what we call metastasis. So you have a cancer that starts in your lung, and it spreads to the liver, or it spreads to the brain, or it spreads to the bone. It spreads by hopping on into the lymphatic system here. So why is staging important? Well, staging is important because it helps influence how we treat you. And in all cancers, whether it be lung, colon, breast, we have four stages. And I'm breaking this down into very, very simple terms because it's, just, it's getting a lot more complicated as we get more information. We are on our eighth edition of this. Quite simply, we have four stages of cancer. Stage one is very early, meaning it's limited to that organ that it started off in, whether it be the lung, the colon, the breast. It stays there. It's only there. Stage four means a very advanced or metastatic. That means it started off in the lung, went to the liver, started, if, started in the breast, went to the lung. It traveled. Okay, And then stage two and stage three are what I call the in-between stages. Not quite just in the lung, maybe it's hopped onto a lymph node, or maybe it's a little bit bigger than we would like. And that's what we call locally advanced. This is similar for most cancers, but this is how I approach lung cancer. Why is this important to know? Well, obviously the earlier, the, er, the earlier and smaller the cancer, the better the prognosis. Meaning at five years time, if you had this cancer, would you still be alive? And we see these huge ranges of numbers because there are multiple subsets in there in, within each of these stages. So if you have the earliest form of lung cancer, you have a 92% chance of being alive and disease-free from lung cancer if, we can, if we're able to treat you, okay? If you have stage four lung cancer, meaning it started in the lung, went to the liver, went to the bone, at five years, not so good. Under 10% of all patients are still alive. And then stage two and stage three, it's a huge range from anywhere from 25 to 60% with stage two being better than stage three. Staging is important because it influences our treatment plan. And we'll talk briefly about all the different types of treatments that we have available. And it's, it's very much like the other cancers that we know about, the breast cancer and the colon cancer. For lung cancer, stage one lung cancer is considered a surgical disease, meaning we can take it out. We can cut it out of you. Stage four, if you have lung cancer and it's spread to your liver, cutting out the cancer in your lung doesn't really help the fact that it's spread to your liver. So surgery is not worth the risk. And so we usually treat with the drugs, the chemotherapy or the immunotherapy. Stage two and stage three, this is where we all work together as a team here. We work, I work as a surgeon with the medical oncologist and the radiation oncologist and the pathologist to come together to, to have a plan that involves surgery. It can involve chemotherapy or immunotherapy or radiation. Sometimes it involves two of the three options. Sometimes it involves all three, depending on your stage. So how do you figure out if you have a lung cancer? Well, you get an x-ray for the most part. And we're not, I'm not talking about chest x-rays. We're talking about CT scans and PET CT scan. So CT scan is what you see here. It's, it looks like it's basically a tunnel that you go through on the, on the x-ray machine. And we have a 3D picture of what you look like on the inside. This is a patient's lung. This is the right lung. This is the left lung. And here's a spot. We call these, these nodules or lesions spots. It's a spot in your lung. The difference between a CT and a PET CT, the, the difference is that a PET CT, we, with the PET CT we give you literally radioactive sugar water because we know that cancers grow, cancers and cells that 
grow, such as the cancer, need sugar, so they will preferentially take more of the sugar water than, than a non-cancer cell. And so when it takes up that radioactive sugar water, it creates a bright spot, or it lights up. This is what we talk about, that bright spot here. Okay, And you can see here, this is a person's brain. It doesn't mean there's brain cancer. It just, you use sugar in your brain. So we don't use the PET-CT for everything, but it gives you an idea that, yes, you use sugar in your brain. That's a good thing. But we don't want to see sugar in the lung. Okay, And if you can look at this x-ray, you see this entire lung field. There's this tiny little spot. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna have any symptoms from that tiny little spot. So our treatment strategy is very simply, we have these three modalities, surgery, cut it out, medication or the chemotherapy, we kill it, and radiation, we burn it. And we work together to do all three, okay? So surgery works well when we can see the cancer, we can feel the cancer, it's in one spot. The medication, the drugs, it can kill some of those cancer cells at one spot, but the, the, the medication's meant for those cancer cells that we cannot see, that are circulating already in your bloodstream or in your lymphatic system that, that are traveling. We can't kill those with surgery. Radiation, we burn, the, we burn it using special x-rays. Again, in that particular spot. It doesn't work well for cancer cells that are circulating. On the right, we have pictures of what's considered the traditional, which is the open thoracotomy, and it's, these cuts are not that big anymore, number one, so don't worry about them. That's the only picture I could find to compare. We would, and we still, we make a, a cut across the chest, spread open the ribs, and go into your chest, okay? Now, that was considered the traditional open approach. Our traditional minimally invasive approach now uses cameras. This is the camera here. We put a camera in, we make three, four small little holes about a centimeter to three centimeters in length, and we're able to do this surgery with these little port sites. And our newest thing is what we call robotic. It's basically a camera with a robot. We have a robot help us. The, the cuts are the same, the procedure is the same. The surgery, the actual surgery, what we do for cancer surgery is the same procedure, just smaller cuts. Obviously with smaller cuts, you have less pain, you get out of the hospital faster, you have a better recovery. The advantage of surgery compared to the other modalities of chemotherapy and radiation, we get more information. When we do a cancer surgery, not only are we taking out the cancer, we're also taking out some of those lymph nodes to gather all the information to make sure we're treating you correctly. The drugs. I can't call this just chemo anymore. In the last five to 10 years, we've had a lot of advancement in our drug therapy. Unfortunately, lung cancer research has been defined by, okay, what, does, what is breast cancer doing? What is colon cancer doing? What is prostate cancer? Maybe we can use some of the same drugs. And that's where most of our lung cancer drugs come from, is the other cancers. There are certain principles about cancer that, that go through all the different kinds of cancers. So chemotherapy, the, that is a medication that is given through your vein. It's our traditional first line therapy, meaning if you're gonna get chemo, this is how you're gonna, if you need drug therapy, we're gonna give you chemotherapy. There are lots of side effects. Chemotherapy is medication that's meant to kill the cancer cells, but it doesn't say, oh, I'm only gonna kill the cancer cells. Preferentially, you want it to kill the cancer cells, but it can also kill regular cells too, meaning nor so when patients have chemotherapy, they may lose their hair, they may feel really sick, they may feel very nauseous, they may have nerve issues or neuropathy as a result of the side effects of chemotherapy. On the newer side, we have targeted therapy or what we call personalized medicine. Basically, we take your tumor, a biopsy of your tumor, and we are able to send it to a lab and say, okay, there's the mutation. This has this gene, this has this gene, and, and we have medication that is directed against those particular tumors. And we now, the newest part of that is a new blood test that, just, that tells us if you have a circulating tumor cell. It's not quite out there yet, but it's, 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 we're using it more and more. Immunotherapy, the difference between target therapy and immunotherapy. Immunotherapy, we're actually using your own immune system to fight the cancer cells. Every cancer cell has specific 
receptors on their, on their body. And we target these receptors preferentially because they are, they are showing up on the cancer cells. It can still affect your normal cells, but to a lesser degree, so the side effects aren't as terrible. But there's still side effects. It is f very expensive still. And we only use immunotherapy in clinical trials or very advanced diseases. We don't use immunotherapy in stage one lung cancer. Some of the things you may hear, some of the names you may hear are Keytruda, Optivo, Nivolumab. There's a lot of pharmaceutical advertisement on TV with, for these drugs. And finally, radiation. This is, a, on the right is a picture of a true beam linear accelerator, which is I think what we're gonna get next door, right? Yeah, in six months. Okay, so we usually we use this with radi with chemotherapy. It basically tries to burn the cancer cells that may have escaped. It burns the cancer cells that are in the area. It can help treat some of the complications of lung cancer. Some of the complications if you have cancer that spread to your bone, it's very painful. So they radiate your bone or they radiate your spine to help kill the cancer cells and decrease the pain. In some patients who can't get surgery for stage one lung cancer, whether it be it's not safe, there are too many risk factors, patients not very mobile or active and surgery just be too risky, we can use radiation therapy. So early, to, so last part of the talk, early detection. Early detection saves lives. So early detection means screening, okay? So there's a difference between screening and diagnostic. If you have symptoms, if you have a cough, shortness of breath, chest pain, back pain, you know, weight loss, you're gonna get a diagnostic test because you have a reason to get that test. A screening test, by definition, means you have no symptoms. We're gonna catch you before anything develops. It identifies a subset of a population that's considered at risk, and there's a lot of work to define who those patients are. It's supposed to be cost effective because by doing this screening test, you're gonna save you're gonna save a lot of money in terms of treating the disease, and you're also gonna save a lot of money in terms of the complications of the disease if we catch it early. And some of the most common screening tests that you hear about are the mammograms for breast cancer or the stool studies and colonoscopies for colon cancer. For lung cancer, we now have low dose CT scans. And the difference between a low-dose CT scan or a regular CT scan is just the amount of radiation that you get. So lung cancer screening, these are the eligibility requirements as defined by the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force. You should be between the ages of 55 and 80. I'm not trying to be an ageist if you're 81 or 82. I'm not trying to be discriminatory if you're 50. It, but these are the recommendations that have, have developed. You have to be asymptomatic. Again, no shortness of breath, no cough, no voice changes, no chest pain. You have to have a history of heavy smoking. And what heavy smoking means is a 30 pack year. So if you smoked a pack for 30 years, that's a 30 pack year. If you smoked a pack, half a pack for 10 years, that's only a five pack year. I have patients who smoke two packs for 20 years, that's a 40 pack year. So it's the amount of packs per day times the amount of years that you smoke. That determines your pack year history. And because of the close relationship between smoking and lung cancer, smoking is, by definition, a risk factor. And you have to have sm be currently smoking or have quit within the past 15 years. If you quit more than 20 years ago, your risk of lung cancer goes back to normal. So you don't qualify for lung cancer screening, unfortunately. And the recommendation is if you meet all these criteria, you, get, you should get an annual CT scan to screen for lung cancer. Now, the lung cancer screening test is covered by Medicare and most major insurances. It's considered part of your health maintenance. So screening stops when you turn 81, or again, if you fall out of the eligibility requirements, if, if it's been 16 years since you quit smoking or you know, or you don't meet the pack of your history, you don't meet eligibility. Or you develop a health problem that 
that makes you unwilling or unable to have surgery. And I, they say surgery, but it really should be treatment. So if you've had a, a debilitating stroke and we're not gonna operate on you, we're not gonna, you don't need to do screening. And so does lung cancer screening work? So we have these two national, you know, national trials. The National Lung Screening Trial was based in the U.S. It was a multi-center randomized controls trial of about 53,000 subjects across the nation looking at chest x-ray versus CT scan. And we were, they were looking at specifically lung cancer mortality, meaning the death rate of lung cancer in this patient population. And we found that over a three-year period, low-dose CT scan reduced your risk of dying by 20% over by getting a low-dose CT versus a chest x-ray. And it was this trial that led to the eligibility requirements of that we previously reviewed. Okay? The most recent trial is based out of the Netherlands and Belgium, and it was just published this time last year showing a population-based registry. So you can do this in the Netherlands and Belgium. It's nearly impossible to do in the United States. But basically every patient, because I think they have a national health care plan, they're enrolled in a registry. And so they were able to track a population, their population for a 10-year period and showed that men who, patients who were in, enrolled in lung cancer screening versus not, in men there was a 26% risk reduction of death and a 39% risk reduction in women by screening for lung cancer. They also found that the earlier the, the patients in the screening, when they were diagnosed with lung cancer, they found them at an earlier stage, so the curable stage. About 65 to 70% were, were considered early stage, stage one to stage two, and th those patients do well. In the non-screened population, the, the arm where you didn't have the screening, most of the patients, 70% of the patients, were found at stage three or stage four, much later. So my final thoughts. So if you smoke, if you know somebody who smokes, please stop. If you currently smoke or used to smoke heavily and you meet the criteria, I would strongly suggest getting a lung cancer screening test. And right now it's a very exciting time for lung cancer treatment. Like I said, those drugs and the, even the techniques of minimally invasive camera surgery and robotics, that's only been around for 15 years. So, so we're finally addressing lung cancer as a specialty. And that's it, thank you.